Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico here of the Des Moines Register talking about Iowa's 10 to 7 home loss to the Iowa State Cyclones. Kennington Smith, my colleague, uh, I don't know where you were in September of 2014, but that was the last time that the Cyclones beat the Hawkeyes in football. So this is a big this is a big loss uh, for the program. And obviously we're going to talk about why they lost, why they didn't switch quarterbacks, but uh, I was pretty. I would say the mood is pretty dark right now around this program. Yeah, I mean that was um, a pretty emotional presser. I don't think that there's been an atmosphere like that probably since the Big Ten championship, where you see a team that was really um, dejected at the way that they were. I got the sense that they felt great about their preparation, um, and it just didn't translate to the field, at least on the offensive side, um, and. I think especially Sam Laporta, we have a video up um, on our Hawk Central site and our YouTube of him um, talking about the struggles on offense, about how um, there's not a lot of receivers and how that maybe affects the, the tight end play, uh, talking about Spencer Petras, and you could uh, feel the emotion coming off of him um, afterwards. Defensive players talked about it as well, um, and then Kirk Ferentz closing out the, the presser. All of them really just talked about how tough of a loss it is in rivalry games, obviously a huge priority, but when you have six consecutive wins over your rival, um, you know, to lose like this at home, especially in a game that was very winnable, it hurts a lot. And I think that for the offense, especially, they're at a point where they are certainly at crossroads this season, but I think that um, these first two games have really exposed how much of a crossroads they're at moving forward. Yeah. I think that's a tough, uh, a tough pill to swallow only two weeks into the season when you had so many high expectations. So there's a, a lot to unpack in what I just said, and we're going to talk a lot about that as we get through this podcast. But um, a really a, a emotional setting, an emotional loss, obviously, and that's being felt throughout the, uh, the entire locker room, I would say. Yeah, we will be live with you until about 920. Then we got to make way for the Cyclone guys because they have a podcast to do too. So we got to go first here. Um, so Chad Lastico, Kennington Smith of the Des Moines Register, some questions are coming in here as we go. But uh, let's uh, we're going to get to the quarterbacks, what Ferris said about the offense, all that. Pretty much probably I'm guessing the whole podcast. But just want to say out of the gates, I mean, I'm looking at the box score, which is very, very uh, minute. <laughs> There's not much to it. Uh, the Iowa defense has allowed one touchdown this season. It took a 21 play drive and I think six for six conversions on third down. Correct. Yes. To, to finally score on this Iowa defense. Uh, it's just a, it's just a gut punch to think to yourself that you have a defense that created three turnovers today, uh, has allowed one touchdown that it took a 21 play drive to score on them. And you, did I say they blocked two punts today? They blocked yeah. two punts today, <laughs> and they lost the game 10-7. All they needed was 11 points, just two more safeties, but they, they couldn't get those uh, points. And uh, so just that's just how bad the offense is. You get all that help, and the only scoring drive of your season so far, only touchdown drive is a two-play, 16-yard, uh, all-running play march to start this game. So you thought it was going to be a good day, but then it wasn't. Yeah, I mean, looking at the the defense, this was probably, um, you know, what what Hawkeye fans feared the most would happen is that there would be a moment where the defense um, faltered a little bit and they took a, a tough blow and the offense wouldn't be able to counteract that punch. And I think that the most frustrating part about it is that Iowa would not have been in that situation had they capitalized on several opportunities prior to that point. And speaking on the defense, I think you asked Quinn Schulte about how much wear and tear maybe throughout the game mm -hmm. impacted them on that series. And he's not going to go up there and say, you know, yeah, we were tired. But I think that it's, it's fairly obvious to, to think that there was some impact in that. I mean, you look at the, the play discrepancy almost 30 more plays on the Iowa State side. They held the ball for almost 20 minutes longer. And just the amount of turnaround that the defense was having to face throughout right. the entire yep. game. You, Terry Roberts gets an interception three plays later, four plays later, including the punt. The defense is back on the field. You have a situation where right before halftime, Iowa has it with four minutes left. You think there's a chance to go get points. They three – they um. 
but they did three and out. They kick it back to um, to Iowa State. Then they get the ball back again. Two plays later, they throw an interception. Iowa's defense is back on the field again and have to get an interception to erase um, that mess. And it seemed like that was just a consistent theme throughout the game. Special teams were setting them up in good position. The defense was setting them up in good position. And it was just three and out, three and out, punt, punt, or turnover, putting the defense in a tough spot. And they were just having to consistently um, put out fire, as they like to say. Um, yeah. This was just one of those times where Iowa got got. I mean, they're out of, I haven't been here very long. I don't know how many 90 play drives Phil Parker has given up recently or 99 play drives. I would assume very little, um, but this was just one of those times where it happened and it happened at the worst possible time because, you know, at that point, at least what I was, was getting on Twitter, I don't know how much you were checking the timeline during the game, but that seemed like it felt like that was a game winning drive by Iowa state. Like there wasn't a lot of confidence that the offense would be able to uh, respond and and put the and tie the game at least or or put the team back ahead. So it's just one of those unfortunate times where the the defense um, didn't hold up, and that's unfortunate uh, because they played great. And honestly, a lesser defense would have given up way more points um, than they did. You think about two times Iowa State had it inside the ten yard line and came away with zero points. I mean, what more what more can the can the defense do really in, in those type of, of situations? So. Um, you know, unfortunate, but um, you know that's that's football. I know that's like a <laughs> I know it's a buzz phrase that Iowa fans um, don't like, and I didn't mean to uh, make it. Wow, that's yeah, that was it just came out like that. Yeah, it know? just came out. That, okay. that really is right. how I mean. That's just the game, though. Sometimes, like all right, so we gotta we gotta cut. We gotta start drilling down in the offense here because we don't have a lot of time left. So that's all we're gonna talk about the defense, which we. Right. I didn't even think we talked that long about the defense. So let's get to the <laughs> quarterback situation. Uh, I. I was stunned that there was not a quarterback change at halftime, given what Brian Ferentz kind of laid out on Wednesday, uh, given that Spencer Petras not only fumbled away a ball at midfield, uh, but threw an inexplicable interception where at the end of the half, where again, the defense defense bailed him out. But uh, that's the, like the one thing that Ferentz will not stand for. I mean, we've seen that with running backs. We've seen that with, you know, everybody except Spencer Petras, he does not get benched for two turnover game and a tight game when you cannot afford these things. And he talked about it last week, uh, you know, and it wasn't Padilla. I, I was literally stunned. Like I, I know Kirk Ferentz is stubborn, but I was literally stunned that it wasn't Padilla, especially given what Brian said. And this is a head coach decision though. That's the thing. So this was Kirk saying, we believe in Petras also said afterwards, not enough evidence or whatever, not enough to assess, I guess, uh, uh, you know, given the shorthanded like wide receiver core or whatever, like to, to hold that against Petrus and the equity in the program. And I was like, come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> like it's not showing up out there. Like what, how could it possibly be worse with Alex Padilla, a guy you say you trust, but you don't trust him. Yeah. I think Ridiculous. That I think that's the biggest takeaway is that there is obviously not the trust there that they say is there. And when we talk about program equity, doesn't even make sense though. Right. He showed up last year and won three big 10 games. Right. And this is really interesting when you think about program equity, because this is not Spencer Petras versus Joe Labus, who has never played in an actual Right. Right. This is Alex Padilla, who is in his fourth year in the program. And like you, to your point, like you said, those games last fall, were literal do or die games like win yeah. or you don't go to the Big Ten championship. And Alex went in there and he won those games. So I'm not really sure. Um, and I'm going to dig into this a little bit. Um, I feel like my next story that's coming out tomorrow morning is kind of like what exactly is this this disconnect between what we're seeing uh, on the field and what we hear is happening in practice? Because to me, it just sounds like. Um, you know, Spencer's just a, a, a great practice player, and maybe Alex isn't a great practice player. I don't know. I guess that's what it sounds like to me, just because he he just continues to go back to what they see on the day-to-day basis. So I don't know exactly what that is um that, that he's speaking of, but you know, I agree with you. What it cannot be worse. Like literally, it could not be any worse than, than than what we saw. I don't know what exactly it's going to take for Padilla to get opportunity. When we were up here in the press booth, all of us were under the assumption that that 
um, last interception right before half, that was going to be the last pass that that we saw of, of Spencer for the rest of the game. And they continue to put him out there. And I don't know if you were in the, the media room when Spencer said this at the beginning, but he said there really wasn't uh, much conversation about quarterback changes or anything like that. It was just a very businesslike as usual at halftime. And Kirk really didn't go into a great amount of detail about why he decided to stick with Spencer other than he just felt like that was the, the best course of action. But I found it really interesting that unlike last week where um, after a really poor performance, he was so um, committable to Spencer and very outright he is starting in the next game and he wasn't that committable. That's true. At that time. So I don't know what that means. It could be something. It could be nothing. But I think it's telling that seven days later, he didn't outright say with, with full confidence that he is going to be the uh, the starter next week. And yeah. especially yeah. after, you know, this week's game was pretty much the exact same from, from last week's game, just speaking on Spencer's play um, specifically. I mean, it was – it was bad in the first game. It was bad in this game. He was um, overthrowing players. He missed Arlen on several times. Some of them were throwaways, but there were some missed passes in, some inexplicable misses in, in this one as well. Yeah, uh, let's talk about next week because, uh, you know, it's just going to make people <laughs> angry, understand, trying to unpack why he didn't uh, make the change. And we're not saying that Alex Padilla is, like, going to take the world by storm and that's going to fix the offense, but – it's just r remarkable stubbornness to to not see the fact that that Spencer didn't have it, and I hate do I hate knocking on his performance, but it's if there for everybody to see, and it doesn't matter if you're good in practice, if you're forty five percent, which is what he is this season with like no big plays, like you you got to move on. And I know there's people in the YouTube here posting Charlie Jones's stat lines. Uh, which is a very valid. I don't even know what he finished with, but you told me he had like three touchdowns. At one he point. had nine catches for 133 yards and three touchdowns at halftime. Okay. So, you know, obviously Iowa has no receivers right now. Uh, Erlen Bruce, the only scholarship guy, but, and then it's, it's funny because Ferentz is like, yo, it's not an excuse, but then he is making excuses for it too, which is also like, you know, Basically, he, he thinks like it's going to get better when Keegan Johnson, Nico Regini, all those guys get back. But um, and I don't yeah. know. It's just it's still it doesn't mean you don't try the other guy. But uh, right. So uh, anyway, next week, what I mean. So here's the problem. Like if he sticks with Petrus, I mean, they're going to win next week against Nevada. Yeah. So you're not. I mean, he's. I could see him sticking with Petrus. Against Nevada, I'm not, and I just think that that is. I think the ship has sailed there. It's 21 games in. His career high at home is 224 yards in a game. He was under 100 yards today. Uh, I know you don't have receivers, but uh, and I love Spencer. I mean, probably the the best interview for a quarterback ever. But it's just, it's not even, it's not even his fault really. Like it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just not showing up, and you. It's amazing that he keeps getting that chance. Yeah, I think that for for the most part, the frustration from the fans has – obviously they're frustrated with Spencer's play, but I think the overwhelming majority of the frustration has shifted over to Kirk. And yeah, I'm, I, I, it's 100% on Kirk. Yeah, they're the 100%. ones who are continuing to to put him out there, and he's going to go out there and, and do his best. But we've seen what, what it's looked like. And those are the results that are um, likely going to continue um, if he's out there playing. And for me, another interesting thing about what this means for Nevada and every week afterwards is that and I think this, you know, people know this, that wholesale changes are not coming in season. So what the offense is, for the most part, obviously, when Keegan and Nico come back, there's going to be some opening of the playbook. They'll be able to run some more schemes. But for the most part, like the personnel and the, the schemes that they run and the plays that they run. This is what Iowa's offense is going to be this year. And the simple answer, and fans may not like it, but the players said as much after the game is they're just going to have to execute the plays better. They're not going to be able to change their playbook in a week or have you know crazy changes between now and Nevada or now in Michigan or do anything during the, the bye week that is going to be unveiling some new offense. So this is what the offense is this year. It's disappointing because Kirk doubled down on this offense in January. 
and he didn't go and, and seek any outside help via the transfer portal. He didn't bring in a quarterback coach or a co-offensive coordinator, or anything like that. So this is just what the what the offense is. I think that looking um, looking ahead to next year and the years afterwards, and I put this in my post game mailbag. The Iowa's offense is at a significant crossroads right now, where they are going to have trouble recruiting at the quarterback in the skill positions moving forward if the offensive scheme stays the way that it is. I can speak for myself as a Georgia fan. We negative recruiting happens everywhere. We are we're no different. We have taken losses in this recruiting cycle, even off of the national championship because of what um, coach is saying about our offense and how we distribute the ball and everything like that. It does not help that Charlie Jones is going crazy like he is at Purdue, a division rival, no less. Coaches are taking notice of this. They're going to use it against Iowa. That's just you know what it is in the recruiting game. And Iowa is going to have problems not only replenishing the room at receiver and other positions, but keeping the players that they have um, on the roster happy and bringing in true difference makers moving forward if they're going to continue to put these same offensive results on the field. So I think that you know, in the short term, this is what the offense is. But in the long term, if Iowa wants to, um, you know, stay at the level that they're at and continue to try to compete for Big Ten championships and New Year's Six Bowls, there's going to be some serious wholesale changes needed. Yeah, I mean, I have people messaging me all the time in my text group, like, oh, my gosh, is Keegan Johnson going to transfer? Is that what's going on? And I'm like, why wouldn't you transfer if you're a wide receiver right now? I mean, it's working out for Charlie Jones. I mean, right. seriously, seriously, Keegan Johnson's – Keegan Johnson should go to Purdue next year if he's yeah. <laughs> if I'm being honest. I mean, the way this offense is uh, structured. Uh, so they've got to make a change. They've got to make some excitement, get some excitement going, get a fresh start. Uh, you know, and if, if that may that may mean making Padilla one and Labus two. I mean, he almost it, I know they won't go that far, but it's, it'll be really interesting to see if Ferentz decides to uh, die on the Petrus Hill here or make the switch. Uh, I have a feeling the offensive coordinator would like to make the switch and the head coach wants to stick with Petrus. So it's, it's very interesting to see how this dynamic unfolds. And I really can't believe uh, it, the stubbornness is, is unbelievable, really. <laughs> but, but, you know, he didn't change anything after finishing 121st in the country in offense. All right. We got to get a three word headlines. We only got about eight minutes left here. Let me know if you see some. Uh, here's, uh, I got a bunch marked, at least for now. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mitch Fick, Soggy and Searching. Good one. Uh, Yak, Rock, Yak Rock Hawk. Legacy at Risk. That was an interesting one. I got a lot of those, like uh, a lot of people very much saying that like Kirk is potentially going to tarnish his legacy by kind of going down with the ship with his son as offensive coordinator. You know, and and to waste this defense and special teams, you know, and how remarkable, how remarkable is it, Kennington, that Iowa blocked two punts based on Lavar Woods' schemes that he talked. Lucas Van Ness talked about this, that they noticed a specific weakness in their scheme that allowed them to block two punts and right. set them up for essentially two game-winning touchdowns. If and I still don't like the play, by the way, to give it to Pot of them there, give it to Gavin Williams from one yard out. I did not like that play call at all. I think that one is on Brian Ferentz. But anyway, to waste all that, it, is, it could be a legacy thing. It's It could unravel quick. Yeah. Um, you can speak more to that than me. I haven't been out here very long, but I think that, um, you know, the next several years about the ceiling of Iowa's competitiveness is definitely in question based on the decisions being made about offensive personnel and the, um, I guess you call it refusal to, to change or to adapt. Mark Emmert says, Cy Hawk game, S-I-G-H. Nicely done, Mark. Uh, I kind of, I like, this was a good one from uh, uh, Minnesota Weather Geek. Uh, she says, practice goes well. <laughs> <laughs> I just got a chuckle out of that one. Uh, yeah, um, and I know you're right. I know you're writing about that. Kyle Bullsby, uh, Bob Bullsby's son, who's a great contributor, says, "Make it stop." <laughs> of course, he's rooting for the Hawks. Um, yeah, I see they, one from Mark M D J D Keller, one hundred fifty. 
signaling how many total yards Iowa had today, which is even less than they had last week. So it's crazy. For the people who didn't think that it could get worse, read my mailbag. It, it did get worse uh, statistically. So yeah, under three yards of play for the second straight week. So now, and now we've got, I believe, I have to check my numbers, but I believe. That's now 61st and 62nd in the Kurt, in the Brian Ferentz uh, Hall of Fame here is, uh, in 63 games as offensive coordinator. The only one being worse was 2017 at Wisconsin, 66 yards in that game, uh, 50 plays. So it was brutal. And, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's just you're taxing your defense because you can't even get a first down. And I, like, kind of made a joke in the first quarter, like, hey, they got five first downs already halfway to 10 like <laughs> last week, and they end up with 11 first downs in the game. So right. Um from EMT Hawk, the Hawk State. Um embarrassing Iowa loss. I would have to agree with that. Um that should have been, I mean, Iowa should have won by several scores. I couldn't even say two scores. Like they the chances that they had to 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 score, especially on the plus side of the field, based on what the defense was doing, this uh with a competent offense honestly probably should have been um a very decisive win. Yeah, Paula Gray says sold out season. Oof. Yeah, a lot. Of, I got a lot of messages about tickets will be available uh, for coming games. Uh, I still think that they could make something happen this season, but you can't do the same thing over and over. That's my point of view. They got to make the change to Padilla. At least give that a try. Get some momentum against Nevada, where you see the offense click. You give him two weeks working with the number one offense going into Rutgers and maybe you get Nico back and Keegan back for Rutgers and all of a sudden you know you're back to that offense last year against Minnesota where he threw for two you know threw for two touchdowns and ran for one you know he he did it against Minnesota last year I mean uh and if you go back and study that Illinois game I know he was six for 17 in that game uh it was a ton of drops there's just a lot of drop passes and he didn't have that timing developed so uh I don't know anyway uh, any more? Oh, uh, from Ryan Carlstead. Hopefully, I didn't pronounce your name wrong. Bet the under. Yeah, for sure. Wow. Yeah, seven points in back-to-back games. Let's think about this. I'm going to do this off the top of my head. Well, I know Spencer Peters has one touchdown pass and nine interceptions since the Penn State game last year, so that's pretty ugly. But I think their offensive touchdown numbers are. You think about since the Minnesota game. So Illinois, they had one. Uh, Nebraska, they had one. Michigan, zero. Kentucky, two, correct? Yes. So that's four, zero against South Dakota State, and one today, which, again, was a short drive. So that's, what, five touchdowns by the offense in the last two, three, six games? Yeah. Five touchdowns by the offense in the last six games. And then to put it even further perspective, think about the two scoring drives the offense has gone on this year. A four-play, five-yard drive that resulted in a <laughs> ball, and then a two-play, 16-yard drive today. So what's that? Yeah. Six six plays for 21 yards? That's the – Those are your, your scoring drives of, of 2022. Wow. Yeah, and two fumbles inside the opposing 10-yard line have obviously – Hurt, but you can't say Iowa didn't get him back from Iowa State. So today, so uh, yeah, certainly lost opportunities are the name of the name of the game here. Uh, final thoughts, Kennington. Um, you know, two um, almost worst case scenario for for Hawkeye fans in back to back weeks. I think, like I said previously, I think that offensively. Um, they're, they're at a crossroads. I think Kirk Ferentz is in a lot of ways himself in terms of what he's going to do about the quarterback situation. And then obviously he can't do anything about it right now, but looking at the end of the season, there needs to, um, you know, be some wholesale changes um, offensively, however that may look. I think that he probably should have recognized it at the end of last year, but I think that it is glaringly obvious right now and we've talked about it at length. Their schedule is extremely difficult this year. There are no Indianas and Marylands on the schedule. You have Michigan, you have Ohio State. You still have other tough opponents in your division. So, um, you know, it could be a, a long season. They might be able to turn it around. But I think that these first two weeks have been a true eye-opener for, for him in terms of where uh, offensively the program needs to go. 
Huh, yeah. Uh, did uh, did uh, Nebraska lose today? They're still they, down. They're still they're down still to Georgia Southern. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say the Big Ten West. You know, Wisconsin losing to Washington State today. Um, Northwestern lost at home to Duke. Um, yeah, after, I mean, Nebraska's not going to be a threat. It doesn't look like. So there is still opportunity out there. Uh, <laughs> Idaho is ahead of Indiana, ten nothing. How about that? Uh, so anyway, I just there is so there's time to kind of fix this thing. Maybe give Iowa a shot to. You've got the defense. You got the special teams. If you can get something done at quarterback over these next couple of weeks, this is your chance to make momentum because you can't make the change going into the Michigan game. <laughs> you yeah. know, you, you got to give Padilla a little time to get his legs under him if you're going to make the change. So now is the time to do it. Uh, it seems obvious to me, but uh, again, but, will Ferentz go down with the ship? We'll find out soon. Yeah, for me, if there's not a change before the Nevada game, the next time we need to, the next time realistically for a change is probably going to be the bye week, which I think is the week before Ohio State. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. good luck, good luck. <laughs> right, so yeah. you know, take that as you will. Joe Labus gets the start in Columbus. There we go. After the bye week, fresh start, smoking goes home. Joe, smoking Joe Labus. <laughs> All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. Chad Lace to Coke Hankton Smith. I know it's a tough one, but uh, we'll get back at you Tuesday after uh, Kirk Ferentz's press. We'll be right back here on YouTube. Thanks a lot for joining us, and uh, see you next time.